Tekken Tag was the first greatest hits iteration of the series, which brought back the old lost characters of Tekken 2 and paired them with the Tekken 3 newcomers, including a new boss character in Unknown. From a mechanics perspective, Tekken Tag was largely similar to its predecessor, but with a few key changes. Tech rolling was now possible from the face down position. Tech rolling could be disabled by hitting face down opponents close to the floor for a ground shake tembler effect. Tech roll height was lowered, and pushback in juggles was decreased, making combos a bit easier. Hitboxes were made larger, so that moves like Mishima Flash Punch combo missed less. This also meant that tech catches were a bit more frequent in this game. Tagging was now possible, although the tag system was somewhat bugged in that player 2 would tag in closer than player 1, making for more consistent and damaging tag juggles on the player 2 side. Tagging was slower than it would be in tag 2, but characters were able to cancel their tag into block with an up, up, back, back jump cancel unless they had a backflip. Some characters also had special tag cancel options, such as Xiaoyu's taunts. Characters were given differing health bars, sometimes in quite puzzling ways. Heihachi can take a huge explosion to the face, Mishima had pitiful stamina. Devil, for some bafflingly stupid reason, had the highest stamina in the game, with a full 20% more health than Heihachi. You win. Tag Rage or Netsu was introduced. Like Tag 2, characters would get mad when their partner was beaten up and would have their damage increased. Certain evil characters would not get Netsu for any reason, such as Devil or Ogre. There were some exceptions to this rule, namely Green Ling and Gold Tetsujin, which were the only characters beloved enough to arouse rage in anyone even from an ancient god of war. Combo damage followed far more consistent scaling. Low parries were now universal. They forced opponents into crouch for about plus 10 on punches and plus 16 on kicks. Jin pops up again, and it's not going to be the last time. While much of his insanity from Tekken 3 was gone, the core gameplay of the character who would later become Devil Jin is extremely strong in every game that it's present in. He's hard to turtle against with any form of movement and hits like a truck, while Flash Punch Combo and Electric Wind Godfist are hard to get in on while Standing 2 was still unpunishable or near unpunishable by most characters, including Jin himself. Demon Steel Pedal made its first appearance here, and he had extremely high damage, coupled with stable juggles. His tag buffered special mid EWGF was perhaps the best move in the game, as it had a fat enough hitbox to tech roll catch. Its only downside was that the teams who typically paired well with Jin, namely Devil or Kazuya, had weak tag juggles, particularly from the player one side. Kazuya and Devil typically occupied the same spot on the team, as they would not realistically be paired together due to an agonizingly slow tag animation. Angel was also basically just whack devil, so we'll ignore her. Both had the Mishima Godfist, which was minus 10, but had so much pushback that only Devil himself could punish it with any sort of reliability. As well as, of course, Mishima Staples in Hell Sweep and Flash Punch combo. Kazuya's advantages were in his ability to punish ducked highs and blocked lows with his safe 10 frame twin pistons his plus 7 safe on block stature smash, which synergized very well with his right split kick, his back one jab, which he'd stolen from tech and 3 Jin, and his superior sidestep. Devil's strengths were in his safe 13 frame standing twin pistons launcher, his very safe down forward 2, which provided a semi-free wind godfist, 
or thanks to the nosebleed glitch, a completely free, just frame hell sweep juggle if you're a bad man. It is very worth noting though that you likely did not play Devil in order to be a bad man. You played him because you were, quite frankly, scum. He also had better reach, a useful straight up hop kick, and higher stamina. All being said, Devil was probably a little more reliable, in part because of his incredible ease of use. <laughs> The Changs were fairly similar. Both had outrageous 10 frame counter hit Magic 4s, their G Clef Cannon and 8 frame counter hit Launcher, their Machine Gun Cannon, which did much the same thing, the slow Power Punch, where the second hit wouldn't even come out on block, making it a perfectly safe mid launcher and a devastating tool for punishing ducks or even punishing some tech rolls, and powerful generic throws with dangerous Okizeme afterwards. The four follow-ups to Elbow had pushback, making it tricky for many characters such as Jin to punish, and was a full launcher. Julia was the stable option. She had slightly more stamina, a better throw game, which meant for a lot in a game where throws were genuinely extremely hard to break, and a tag cancel. Michelle was the more unstable but more powerful hitter. Her Elbow and Shotgun properties were swapped, so that she had a counter hit launching elbow, and a shotgun knocked down and did a shocking 18 points of damage, making it the most powerful juggle filler of any of the cast. But her weaker throws, lower diversity, smaller stamina, and most of all, lack of an easily applicable tag cancel hurt her. <laughs> Like Jin, Ogre was toned down from Tekken 3 while still remaining one of the best characters. His Azteca shoot was a low mini launcher, which tremendously complemented his powerful ground game and mixed well with his new, devastating right splits kick, which gave him free follow ups like Hop Kick, Power Punch, or even Serpent's Venom on crouching opponents. While Waning Moon was now breakable, its follow-ups were improved as Ogre could hit a tagged Blazing Kick into Tag Dive as an optimal combo with good wake-ups. This also helpfully incentivized people not to pick the horrible team of Devil Ogre, as Devil couldn't perform the Tag Dive. Ogre's deadly slash unblockable was more powerful, as he could now combo off of it effectively. His stamina was also high. His sidestep was the second best in the game after Armor King, and he had a rich, deep move list with tons of tricks. Tekken Tag Bruce was perhaps his most powerful iteration. While he lacked Black 2, the move which would later become his signature, and his Crouch Dash mix ups, he had a number of nasty tools. One of these was long reaching, powerful jab strings. While his 1-2 jab wasn't actually guaranteed on hit, it gave such huge advantage on counter hit that it guaranteed forward 2-4, which was also pretty much the only good 12-frame punisher in Tekken Tag. His 1-2-1-2 was also 8 frames and guaranteed on counter hit, which was particularly nasty against big characters. His forward 2 down 4 couldn't be blocked after the initial jab, and his double elbow was extremely safe on block at minus 2 and gave a huge launch on counter hit. His big knee, up 4, and down forward 2 were also all very powerful, and were all basically safe, with down forward 2 even being unparryable, for the most part anyway. The Bruce special string was a safe 14 frame counter hit launcher for ridiculous damage and he had a safe low in Leg Slicer. On the downside, his throws and Okizeme were not incredible as he didn't have a 1 plus 2 break, and he couldn't punish range whiffs as well as Ogres or Mishimas. True Ogre was a much more fun character than Vanilla Ogre, with his tech roll catch horns and big range mix-ups. But his lack of sidestep and the abuse he got from certain characters such as Bruce, Yoshimitsu, Changs, made him far less reliable. Heihachi had special mid-electric wind gauntfist, dark thrust, 
and the right split kick EWGF combo for punishing crouch commitments. But he was heavily reliant on throws for his mix ups, and his low stamina was a major deterrent. Armor King had the best sidestep in the game, combined with Dark Upper, one of the best whiff punishers. But his mids were quite lacking. While his tag buffered chopping elbow was a whopping plus 6 on block, orbital heal was neutral, and his muck kick was only minus 5, Brian had terrible tracking and almost no ability to hit opponents on the floor. His throws were correspondingly weak, and his chains of misery grab did not have the same shortcuts it would have in later games. This is also the only game where his taunt didn't give free hits, which is extra baffling considering how completely impossible it is to even land in a game where a single backdash puts you three light years away from the opponent. He'd often be paired with Bruce, who did most of the heavy lifting in this matchup, which helped with Brian being overrated. This is a frequent dynamic with tag games, where players will misremember the strength of certain characters because they paired them with partners who were actually good. For other examples of this phenomenon, see those who paired Jin, who was good, with Porong, who was bad, or Julia, who was good, with Anna, who was also bad in Tekken Tag 2. You know who you are. Prototype Jack was big, slow, and where other Jacks had great throw games, he didn't even have a one-break option. Big abuse was rife on him, and there really wasn't much of a reason to pick him. His hilarious side throws and funny class 1 launcher combos aside, he was one of the worst characters in Tekken history. Tekken Tag Tournament is one of the most beloved iterations in the series. While less broken than Tekken 3, it's probably even more unbalanced. The gap between the top and the bottom of the cast is absolutely colossal, and even the gap between top and mid-tier characters is vastly bigger than the distance between the bottom and the top of the entire roster in recent games. It's hard not to argue that the game wouldn't flat out just be a better competitive experience if Devil didn't exist. The criticisms don't stop there. Many characters are insubstantial shadows of what they would have become. Not merely weak, but often so limited as to be boring. Chasing down a determined turtle who has a life lead on you while using a weaker character is often near impossible. However, despite this, Tekken Tag Tournament deserves its reputation as a classic. Movement is difficult but rewarding. Move lists are short and can be quickly understood, and wacky launches that carve through everything are rare. Combos were weaker than they would be in virtually every game afterwards. It was the last Tekken without any remotely practical death combos. While combos were short, the Okezeme game was complex and punishing, with significant risks involved in both back rolling and tech rolling. Timing and spacing were paramount in the neutral. While it was unbalanced, the dominant teams were both extremely fun to play, and in very different ways. If you're a tech and tag tournament head, then everything else will feel watered down or filled with superfluous fluff. It's the whiskey no chaser of the series, defined by its clean simplicity. Thank you very much for watching. These videos are made possible by our generous backers over on Patreon. So if you'd like to keep this channel going, please head on over to patreon.com slash thatblastedsalami. And for just $1 a month, you can be listed here next to these fantastic people and also get some cool rewards like early access to our videos, exclusive PDFs of the scripts, wallpapers, and so on. This time, we'd like to thank Johnny, Fox McLeod, Nick Monacelli, and Wesley Hammersley. Also, if you'd like to stay up to date on all things Salami, you can follow me on Twitter over at Aria Taebi. Have a great day, everyone. Next time on the Retrospective series is Tekken 4.